So we're going to, this is our second look specifically at, at uh, the concept of meta narrative. And I, I, I'm hoping that we can be uh, bold enough to actually have some stuff sewn in us that'll help us um, rewrite our meta narrative if it needs rewriting. Hey, we got another dog. <laughs> Dory is, is definitely the largest visitor tonight. She's a sweetheart, so good. You guys, I see you're spaced out nicely around the sanctuary. <laughs> uh, and they need to get to know one another at some point. We'll see how this works. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, of, uh, of learning and of being conscious of the influences in our own heart and life. And so I ask you to, to, <laughs> I ask you to speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to take a drink. Okay. I love this place. So, tonight's challenge is to edit the scriptural foundation of our gospel narrative, if it needs it, you know, if it needs it. Not everything we believe is wrong. Something that the Lord really uh, uh, helped me with this week as I was preparing this is he said, you don't have to be adversarial about this. You know, you don't have to be adversarial about this. You don't have to make your decisions in comparison to everybody else's or in competition to everybody else's. Because really, uh, truth has to be revealed. And you, you get to see it if you can see it. And Paul said, I had another little bit of a thing that I'll just throw out there as a potential revelation might let you think on it. I've lived for a while now, placing a significant amount of importance on the concept of, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, toward the end of the chapter, where God says, uh, or where the, where the Word says, that we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And I think I've told you guys a lot of times, I ask my friends, so how do you feel about the part you don't know? I had a friend answer it really honestly the other day, he says, I, I don't like it. <laughs> That friend sitting here actually has a pretty cool conversation. Uh, but I understand it. I understand it. <clears throat> but here's the revelation that I had, and I just, I'll put this out there. I think it's a revelation. I think chapter divisions, which didn't exist in the manuscripts, struck again here. Because at the end of chapter 13, chapter 13 is that chapter about love, and then Paul goes in to talk about we know in part, we prophesy in part. But the very next chapter, chapter 14, is all about the order of things in the church where Paul is saying, you know, uh, you can all speak in tongues, but I would rather that you prophesy and let two or three prophesy and let the others judge and all this kind of stuff. And I was just sitting there thinking, wow. Because the thing that, that, that I have believed for a long time is that God has engineered the release of revelation to us so that we need one another. Because if I know everything, I don't need you. But I don't know everything. I can't know everything, no matter how much I try and no matter how much I think I do on, at a bad day. I, I need what you know. And I think if you pull that chapter break out of there and just start reading in that verse and read straight into the thing about tongues and prophecy and, and judging the prophecy and everything, I think maybe those things are related. But anyway, I'm kind of excited about it. All right, so here's tonight's challenge. I got two review slides, Richard. One of them is to become conscious of our meta narrative is important because the influences exerts on what we believe and how we hold to and share the beliefs we have. And I made this statement, and I've been thinking about it this week, and I honestly believe it's true. Which I thought it was true last week, but I mean, I'm still thinking about it, and I still think it's true. It is literally impossible to significantly change your beliefs without changing the underlying meta narrative. Because the story that's running behind what you see is, in fact, going to govern what you believe. And so that's why it's worth taking a look at the idea of meta narrative, even though it's a little bit abstract. And, and it's abstract because we don't always think about it, but there's a story about life that makes us see things a certain way. And you can try as much as you might to change how you see them, but if that story doesn't change. So maybe that's a clue as to how we can transform the way we think. Okay, a meta narrative is a fancy sounding word <laughs> describing a set of foundational assumptions in story form that we rarely question, that lie behind 
and shapes how and why we see and interpret the data. And when I say data, in our context, I'm talking scriptures and doctrine. It could be anything, though, uh, politics or whatever. Events and personal experiences in the way we do. So let me read it without breaking it all up. A fancy-sounding word describing a set of foundational assumptions in story form that we rarely question, that lie behind and shapes how, we, how and why we see and interpret data, like scripture and doctrine, events and personal experiences the way we do. So most of us think that we react objectively and rationally to data. Most of us think when we read the scripture, we are interpreting it correctly. But all of us know, if you slow down and think a little bit, that there's a, a dozen ways to see something, a dozen ways to think about something. And so uh, there's the definition. You're welcome. So here's the assumption for tonight's exercise. <clears throat> While there are a lot of factors that can and do contribute to our individual meta narratives, tonight we're going to rally around the role that Scripture, and I emphasize this, can and should play in shaping our gospel through our uh, meta narrative. Uh, when, when the Lord told me that I don't have to be competitive, and we don't have to be competitive thinking about this, uh, I realize how easy it is to be critical of my former thoughts, my former doctrines, or of other people's current doctrines. And sadly, it goes on in church really all the time, you know, uh, on social media, on uh, church sites, and all kinds of stuff. So tonight, I'm going to actually be uh, sharing some lists from uh, other ministries of scriptures that are put up uh, in presenting the gospel. And I'm not doing this at all to be critical. And I'm, I'm not even really critical, but I do want to point a couple things out about them because I think Joyland has the responsibility as well to have a scriptural foundation for what we believe about the gospel. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to do. And I do think, the reason I emphasize that one situation is I do think that the scripture holds and should hold a very significant place in determining how we talk about things like the gospel how we think about our theology. Scripture precedes theology, or it should, but it, it, it isn't the limit of our experience, but it does inform that meta narrative story. So we'll try to talk about that a little bit. Okay, this first one. Now, these are some tedious little slides, so I apologize for how small the font might be, but I think you can read it pretty good up there. Um, so this first one has nine scripture references, and I found it... Uh, called the Roman Road to Salvation, or the Path to Salvation. Pretty familiar. It's been around forever since I was young. And so these uh, scriptures are going to be in Romans, obviously. So here's the first one. Uh, Romans 3, 9 through 12, and verse 23. Uh, all are under sin. Now, I don't know another way to do this except look them up and read them to you. And uh, so we'll see how good I am at getting around in my Bible. and reading at the same time. So 3, 9 through 12. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So that is 9 through 12, and then 23. Now, I just wrote this the way they had it on their scripture thing. You know me, you know what I think like, so I was like super curious what uh, 13 through 22 was, you know, because context means stuff, but I'm not going to dig into it too much. It's a continued quote, and it talks about the law and all this kind of stuff, but then when you get down to 23, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Dan pointed out a couple weeks ago, and we've looked at it a couple other times, the very next verse that is connected with that, only separated by a comma, is, and we are justified freely by the grace. So, but uh, the, the emphasis on that verse is no one does righteously, and uh, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the whole of that scripture. Romans 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next verse is a nice one. I'll read it just for the heck of it. Much more than now having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Anyway, that's Romans 5, 8. Romans 10, 9 and 10. So Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So you can get a feel for where this is going, right? As far as the, how you tell, talk about the gospel. Romans 5.1. And this is the order that they had him up in their sight to. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the Roman road. I think that's the last one. Yeah. Now, let me show you what the highlights mean. If, the, if the, one of the verses is in green, that means it's used in somebody else's list of gospel verses as well. I, and I just wanted us to see that. that. And then uh, I highlighted uh, the issues of sin and love. And so in this one, there's three references to sinners, sinners, and there's one reference to love. So that's what those colors are about. Now, this is from a website uh, for Christian writers uh, called Patheos, and the guy that wrote this is a pastor uh, named Jack Bowman. I don't know Jack, but uh, this is his list. So Romans 3.23, uh, it's the one that's a part of that one, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 is the same one, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of uh, uh, God is uh, the free gift of God is eternal life. Romans ten nine and ten is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. We already looked at that one. And then here's a new one: John eleven. John eleven twenty five and twenty six. All right, so John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, he's speaking to Martha, outside of uh, Lazarus' tomb. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And again, these are on sites where these people are suggesting these are scriptures you should memorize, these are scriptures you should use to talk to people about the gospel. Uh, Romans 3, 10, and 11. Did we look at that already? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. Okay, so uh, what is it again? Somebody tell me. That one. Okay. 3, 10, 11. <laughs> okay, all right, good for you. All right, Luke 13, 3. This was an interesting one I thought they contained. It wasn't one I uh, found in anybody else's list. Okay, 13.3. I tell you no. So this was following the question. I don't know why they didn't include the question, but uh, Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? And apparently uh, Pilate had killed a bunch of Galileans. But the, uh, three, um, 13 3 says this I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, I do confess, that seems like a strange verse to pull completely out of context, just to emphasize the idea of repentance, but I get, I get it, kind of. All right, so this is from a church called Downtown Cornerstone in Seattle. It's like a pretty big whopper of a church. John 3. 16 and 7. I thought it was interesting in these ones I looked at that 
John 3.16 was only in this one guy's list, or church's list. You guys know what John 3.16 is? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, or eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So that's 16 and 17. I liked it that he included 17 in there. That was cool. And then Romans 3.23 and 25, through 25. We'll go back there because he includes stuff beyond it, which I thought was kind of cool. So do you see anything out of that? The fact that these first two verses from this church had a little broader context? I mean, I like that. So 3, 23 through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay? Romans 5, 8. I think we looked at that once. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9 and 10, we looked at that. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. 1 Corinthians 15, it's a new one. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And how far were you in? Four. Oh, I already went that far. And he, he finished on he was buried and he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And 2 Corinthians 5.21. I was also surprised this one didn't come up more uh, in, in the other list as much. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And 1 Timothy 1.15. It was the first one I ran across that they went into either of Timothy's epistles. So 1 Timothy 1.15 reads, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I, I am foremost of all. But you can see how it applies to the gospel. And 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. This one was curious to me, but I'll come back to that. Um, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Now, I obviously understand how that's a gospel verse, but anytime I put a list of scriptures together, I almost never start with one that says for or therefore, because you're obviously begging the context of the previous verse. But we'll get to that later. And then way up in 1 Peter... First Peter two twenty four and twenty five. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. So that's the one that's on their church website. And oh, got one more. Three eighteen. 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So again, it's, it's focusing on the gospel story around the cross. And this last one, last, this is the last set, is off of the Desiring God website, and uh, that's John Piper's organization. So John reaches back into the gospel. Actually, John didn't write this. It was his executive director that is on the author's byline. But I'm pretty sure John would agree with it if it was on his site. So 1045. Let 
There is no 1045. Thank you. That was in Matthew. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Nice job, Richard. The phone is faster than the page. Uh, 1045. There it is. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Full scripture. Romans 5.8. I think we've looked at that before. I'll go up there and go. So Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I like that verse. Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is a free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that God causes all things. Is that right? Oh, eight thirty two. Dyslexia going on here. Eight thirty two. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Let me read that again. I'm going to make a comment on that later. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Second Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians 8.9, 8.9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Okay? 1 Timothy 1.15. We looked at that, I think, just a minute ago, but I'll go back there. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And 1 John, this was the first one to leap up into 1 John, I thought that was cool. First John 14. In this is love... Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That one has both love and sin in it. And in Revelation 5, 9. How come I can't find 9? I see eight. Yeah, really. Oh, there it is. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then I just wrote an incredibly tiny note that you can't read. But so out of these four ministries, and the, the, what they posted online as scriptures to talk about the gospel, there are 26 unique scriptures, uh, not counting the, the ones they used multiple times. 19, focus, or the focus of the scriptures on sin and unrighteousness. Five, focus on God's love. Now, that's not an indictment or anything. That's just the facts of what I did. Now, there's obviously other ministries out there in other sections. So that was kind of one wanted you to see. Uh-huh you're going to be impressed because I actually can go back and forth between them now. Yeah. I could even go back to that one if I needed to. Yeah. PowerPoint skill. All right. Now, 
everybody can see, right? Listening to these scriptures, you can all tell that people are talking about the gospel here, right? They're telling the story of Jesus and all of that. Is, uh, is there anything else that you see or sense or know that you'd like to comment about? It seems that this is the underworking behind the sort of the plumbing behind the scenes of what the real purpose of the gospel is if the real purpose is to the relationship with God. So it's like there's a lot of explaining that may be useful for someone who knows Scripture. And for someone who doesn't know Scripture, it's like, thanks. But it, it doesn't lead you to the relationship, from what I can tell so far. Okay, all right. But it is sort of defining the behind-the-scenes reasoning why a relationship's possible. So it's not like they're wrong or they're bad. It just maybe isn't the right focus. Right, and that's, that's really what I, one of the things I saw when I put the list together. And, and the Lord, like I say, he had led me, he had spoken to me about not being com competitive and, and adversarial about it. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with any of the scriptures that we've looked at. Uh, I think a couple of them leave out context that are kind of important. And I also think that a couple of them are, uh, are uh, uh, taken a little bit out of what their natural meaning is. Jen? So you're asking for observations? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like what the need is and what the solution is. That's what I see. It, it, that's what they're showing. And what, how would you define from these scriptures what the need is? Need for Savior to save you from sin, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So the need revolves around, I, and I would agree, and I don't think this would be being too judgy or anything. I think the need revolves around, in, in this present, these presentations, the need revolves around sin, and the, the solution is that Jesus died on the cross for that. One of the things that strikes me is there's a lot of transaction here. In the sense, go ahead and give me an example of it, one of them that strikes you that way. Okay. Um, God's love while we were still sinners. Yeah. Okay. That lays a little bit of a foundation. Uh -huh. Through God's love, he sent his only son for the propitiation of sins. That's transactional for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Again, there, there's definitely more here about uh, need and solution than there's relationship. Richard. Oh, Richard. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> being being the the God forgave sin. We're, we're being presented with that you're a sinner and you need someone you need someone to change you and Jesus is the one. Uh -huh. But if you come to the place where the sin is forgiven, you can just present that Jesus is here for you and you can have life and have it more abundantly. So these presentations you don't think are featuring the fact that your sins have been forgiven? Yeah, you can you can see that through the scriptures that they read that your sins are forgiven. They're already forgiven. I know, I know. But you don't get it out of this. But list. you don't get it out of here. You need yeah. someone to forgive you yeah. for your sins. Uh, so, yeah, you're it not, feels a little you're like not forgiven that, yeah. yet. There's no, yeah. Okay, right. I agree. Yes, sir. I really like this verse, First uh, Peter two twenty five, which was actually just kind of awkward, but cool. Uh, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. That actually is kind of a relational verse, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Dan? Um, it, it's hard for me to make a general statement on this because I've seen the same verses presented really terribly and really well. Uh -huh. You know, Romans Road, you can talk about the sin part from a very judgmental, harsh, 
you're scum and you're so alienated and God hates you and you know, really have an emphasis or a focus on that. Or you can just say, yeah, there's a problem. Romans 5, 8, God's dealt with it. It's done. And then it's the very same verses. So it's a skeleton that's just sitting there. And depending on the person who presents it, you put the meat on it as to what it really actually means and what the emphasis of all those are. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, don't get me wrong, I'm pretty sure a lot of people get saved. Yeah, it's a couple of dots on a map. And the question is, what's everything in between there? And, you know, a lot of people throw it up because this is their, I've got five minutes to tell somebody something. What do I tell them? Yeah. You know? And yeah. that's okay, but also listen to the Holy Spirit. He may yeah. and some want of the, you to tune that Some of the counsel wrapped something. around these yeah. lists was just that. If you'll memorize these, you'll be able to talk to somebody about it. Right. And, that kind of thing. and you probably need to talk about it a lot more. You know, like there is a problem or there was a problem and it's Romans 5, 8, it's dealt with. Yeah. Now let's focus more on the the good stuff. Like you would never stop at Romans 3, 23 oh. though. You would go into 24. No, because the you'd... whole point of that is that, you know, why was Romans written? He explains the whole thing. Romans 3, then comes Romans 4, and yeah. then comes Romans 5, you know, and there's, you, you can't quit. Right. Okay. So. All right. Cool. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Anybody else? I think that um, this is too much of uh, confusion if we're presenting all these verses to somebody, like for example, you're uh, meeting someone for a couple of minutes in the checkout lane. You cannot go through all this, you know, and then the logic behind the cause and effect, the cause and effect, which is what uh, uh, Paul was very good at. You know, the cause, establish the cause, the effect, and then say there's the consequence. I think uh, we should start probably instead of the Roman road, have uh, John's road, road to present the gospel, which is, which is I've seen very effective, uh, John 3, 16 and 17, which for God so loved the world, the love is there, that he gave his only son, Jesus, who he came as himself, to die on the cross, that whoever can be Hindu, Christian, Muslim, you know, pagan, Satanist, whoever it is, Will, will not perish. That is the perishing. That is the mm -hmm. basis of sin, which is death. It is contained in that verse. But have everlasting life. You can have a life of joy and peace and uh, living with God even right now, starting right now. And then 17 goes to say, for God's heart is that he did not want to condemn the world, but that through him might be saved. And that's the whole reason for which he came 16 was. So these lists wouldn't be the one first point if you only had a chance to sow one point of the gospel into a person's heart, it wouldn't be from these lists. It would be from that section there. Yeah, just John uh, 3, 16 and 16, 17. 17. Which, that's yeah, yeah, that's good. Good. Anybody else? Okay, so we all acknowledge these aren't bad scriptures, right? <laughs> and they, they do convey elements of the gospel. Okay. So here's what I want. This is us. This is why we've been doing this. And I want to ask the question, May we add these, which are going to appear magically in a moment. May we add these missing scriptures. Now, what I do want to do is I want to go back. So one of the things I, that I was struck by and I wanted you to see is that when we first started talking about the gospel, the thought of changing our language about the gospel was almost like we were venturing into the holy place and going to upset something. Now, I don't, that's probably overstating it for most of us, but there was that sense of, you know, fear and trembling, trepidation going in there. Well, this is a church in Seattle. It's a very prominent ministry under John, um, John Piper. There's the Roman Road passage, and then there's another one from a pastor, and I think he's in. Milwaukee or Minnesota or something like that. And there were a lot of different verses that they used. They didn't all use the same verse. And so the thought that I think most of us have is when we've settled in to a meta narrative that includes verse this, verse A, B, C, D, E, and F, that to change that is somehow a dangerous thing. 
But right here, and you could go through the scripture and do a search on gospel verses that tell the, the gospel, or verses, the Bible verses that tell the gospel. And I saw one that was all over the Old Testament, pulling them out of Proverbs, out of Psalms, out of all kinds of stuff. So the point is, is that it's okay for us to pull on scripture differently than the church across the street or down the road or across the country does. It's okay. Yeah, Dave. Oh. It's very situational on the verse that you need to use based on the audience that you're speaking to or the individual that you're speaking to. It certainly can be. Um, you know, out of, you, you, on, on a Jewish person trying to convince them, I wouldn't necessarily use anything out of the New Testament. I would use it out of the Old Testament. Uh-huh. It comes from, from, from the prophets. Yeah. So you're just elaborating on my point. Yeah. That yeah. It, you well, don't it, have to go from a list, right, or a set list, or yeah. what you think that list is. It's kind of situational right, to right. the individual or the so, group. So you're making my other point, which is that I would agree with you and everything you just said, but I think that there's even more influence not over the audience that we're speaking to, but over us. In other words, you're Jewish, therefore you would appeal to the revelation that came through the Old Testament. Correct. And so that's why it's okay for us. And so Richard has had an experience with the love of the Father, so I'm betting that some of the scriptures that you would go to, as your go-to, similar, you know, is about love. Or... You know, so yeah, I, it, it, it's it's not just about the audience. It's partly, but it's partly also about our heart and what, where our faith rests in there, and what what language is comfortable. That's a good point. I'm so proud of being able to back and forth between those scriptures. I'm thanking you for every opportunity to do that. Okay, so now I have another page of scripture that's too small to read like that, except you can read on the screen. Is it okay if we put in Second Corinthians five eighteen and nineteen? Because there was a consensus that 521 was worth reading. I'm thinking 518 and 19 might be worth reading. So I'm going to read it. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, I, for the life of me, can't understand why that verse isn't in every list about the good news. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. I, well, you know, and I think maybe there's that reason. It's because that's not thought of as the gospel story. It, it kind of contradicts the whole thing. Uh, no, no one is good. No one has done anything righteous. You know, that kind of stuff. Okay? So, obviously, I can make a case for these scriptures because I picked them. Ephesians 1.5. And I'm open to thoughts about, about you know, or you can kind of vote by just yelling something or whatever. Yeah. yeah, you've been watching Canada, huh? Ephesians 1, 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Actually, you could back up to 4, to put it on there. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. To me, that Ephesians passage has got to be in the gospel. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Yes, Ronnie. On your slide, you say, may we add these missing scriptures. Could you potentially say, may we use these missing scriptures? In other words, not necessarily adding these to the list of what was there before, but just well, be yeah, used yeah, that's, that's a fair in and of themselves. Wording, uh, titles are just titles, you know. But okay. No, no, but yeah, absolutely. Now, some of these you might not want to run parallel. Like, I probably wouldn't run the one uh, no one is righteous, no one is done good, and all, all that kind of stuff, you know, because it doesn't seem like it fits this this context. But isn't your idea here that if we're going to potentially look at our meta narrative, maybe these could be used instead? Instead of some of the ones. But I wouldn't want to get rid of these instead of 
uh, Romans 3.23 and, and 24. I, I, I like that, you know. We've all sinned, but we've been freely saved. So yeah, it's, we're just, these are components that we're considering adding to our meta narrative that'll help our story. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. I'll go back there. There it is. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The reason that I think maybe we should con- include that in our gospel presentation is it, it tells us where we're going to. We don't have to keep living for ourselves. We don't have to keep being a victim of our own lust and our own circumstances. He died. We died. Now, maybe one reason people don't con- uh, choose this in their gospel narratives is because it's a little of a confusing thought. Like, I'm not dead. But maybe we should work through that because there is mystery to this. There's reality and mystery to this thing. What do you guys think of that verse? Would you... Are you for it or against it? (laughs) Okay. For it. All right, now this is a personal pet peeve. There were three things up there that included 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. Why didn't they include 1 Timothy 4 with that? For God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That speaks to motive, doesn't it? That speaks to the heart of God. So I feel at liberty to add that to the list in exchange for a couple of those others, perhaps. 1 Corinthians 15.22 I'll read that one. It's an interesting one. This is a... Maybe people are afraid that this will start a theological argument rather than get the person to get saved. But it's an interesting verse. It seems to have a bearing on the, uh, on the gospel. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. What's the matter, Richard? Well, I mean, you'd have to go someplace with this one. Yeah, you'd have to have a little explanation. Yeah, because, I mean, okay, who's Adam? Um, What do you mean, Adam? So what? If Adam died, whoever this Adam is, but doesn't, yeah, there's... Good point. Yeah. Good point. All right. Okay, this is one, and and this could, again, but because it means a lot to me. I mean, like I say, I was one picking him. Um, but I have a slide to rectify that in just a moment. Colossians, where are we at? Colossians one twenty five. Colossians one twenty five through twenty seven. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You'd have to use that one, Dave, if you were talking to a Gentile friend. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is the point that I don't see in these other, other gospel scenarios that I'd like to see. Okay, how about John 14, 20? Can anybody think of a good reason to not have, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you? There we go. There we go. That would be a great response to the conversation. When is that day? Is that day now? If, then, then you might have a chance to back up a couple of verses and see Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit being sent and that he's going to come. And then you might actually get in a conversation with somebody who would say, so you're trying to tell me that in some way Jesus is in me? And I would love to get to that conversation in the gospel. But you don't ever get to that conversation if all you're presenting is a transactional thing that you get to act on later. Galatians 1.16. 
Now, I don't know if I'd use this in the gospel, but I, I certainly would talk to somebody about what, what the issue was when we got there. So this is a, this is a tough one, and I put this in here because... Um, well, I just, I'll share it with you. So 116. One fifteen, sixteen. What did I put up there? I think I put this. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. The point there is, was pleased to reveal his son in me. I would love to have a conversation with somebody when we were sharing the gospel about Christ being revealed in them not just to them, and not just presented as a person in history that did something that would benefit them if they believed it. And I, I could be dissuaded that some of these should be on our published list. We're going to an elders retreat, and we'll be talking about some of these things. <laughs> so this is part of what we're looking at. How about John ten twenty seven? My sheep hear my voice. I'll read the whole thing. And then a person, as you, uh, as you say, depending on what their l- biblical language is and their exposure to church, well, what do you mean? Who, who's his sheep? Are you his sheep? Am I his sheep? That kind of thing. So what is it? 1027? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 2728. That sounds like it should be in a gospel presentation, doesn't it? I mean, good, grief. You throw in a little security, comfort. First John. I think this is one. Now this and I'll make a case for it. It's a little bit of a complicated scripture. Not really. It speaks to life issues. 4, 15 through 20. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loves us. I got to say that if I only had one chunk of scripture to present the gospel with, it would probably be this one. Think of that. Think of the difference between dangling in front of somebody, escaping hell, only after you can persuade them that they deserve to go there, and holding out the promise that there will be no fear of judgment for you at the end of your life. I think that's amazing. John 17, through and 3. This is another one. I think it's sad that this isn't included in the gospel a lot. I think it's even sadder that it's almost never preached on. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life. They may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I mean, come on. That's, that could be a whole gospel presentation itself. Luke 12.32 You ever hear anybody say this in a gospel presentation to uh, a person? But seek his kingdom. Oh no, sorry. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. That makes for a whole different tone of the gospel presentation. 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And then, I, I guess it could be a little technical, but I don't understand how it is we're trying to present the gospel of the kingdom without presenting the covenant in which that gospel exists. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Now you'd have a question there. How does that apply to me? Because I'm not in the house of Israel. So I understand that. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, even you. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. So the question you know, do you guys feel the liberty to add some of these scriptures to fill out what you're trying to tell people about the love of God for them? Flip this. We started at the thing of, you know, what are the verses for uh, witnessing? I, I, you didn't actually say it, but that's kind of the implication. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. How we talk about the gospel. How right, and I think often what we do is, this, well, if I just know this, this, and this, then I can do witnessing and stuff. And even sometimes it gets so ridiculous, there was a church in town in the Springs that was like, you can only get saved if you have a King James Bible. And it's like, how does King James save you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think part of what connecting this to your whole thing on meta narrative and reframing it is what we really need to be doing as we read this is saying, God, what do I have to offer that you've deposited into me mm -hmm. and to dwell on these things to say, what do I have to share with somebody as opposed to here's a bunch of points right. that are doctrinal that the, I get hit doctrinal that you're points. standing on the outside of right. Yeah. Instead it's like, God, what have you done? What, what have you given me and what do I have a value that's worth telling another person? And sometimes it can be really trivial. I had a guy that I was preaching once, and uh, I just went up to him afterward, and I said, you know, God actually really likes you personally. He thinks you're a great guy. And that... Won him over, huh? That won him... It was like, that was such an unbelievable thing to say that God actually likes you, that he was kind of struck by it. That's cool. And that was the beginning of a change. And it was, you know, no verses. It was just... This is what God thinks of you. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. All right. So any other thoughts? Any other questions? Any other scriptures that, that abide with you guys that you think we should consider uh, editing into our meta narrative? Yes, we I don't have a scripture, but you know, we we talk about witnessing. Uh -huh. And um, I, I'm kind of wondering. Is there a is there a better way than just um, you know coming up with a scripture or whatever? You know, are there other ways to witness to people? Yeah. Other than just quoting scriptures at them? Well, let, let me be clear about what I, I okay. wanted this exercise to be. I don't think that we should just go quoting scripture. I don't think you have to do that. Right. I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing scripture, but I don't think that's mm -hmm. it. I think we need to think about the scripture and and understand what it says about what God offered us in the giving of his son. Yeah, because I think I think the meta narrative of witnessing is that it's just quoting scriptures at people. And I think that has to change in the church. I think we have to move into relationship whether that's quick or whether that's a long-term thing. Um and I think that as we move into those relationships we do um, listen to the Holy Spirit to say, what, what could I say here that comes from truth mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Oh, by the way, that was Romans, you know, yeah, six no, twenty-six. See, let me, like yeah. when I, uh, Jen, your comment about how those those pre previous lists mostly emphasize there's a problem, sin, and there's a solution. Jesus died, and then there's a way to apply that solution, which is believing that. I think that's an accurate, uh, an accurate expression of what th those lists act as the foundation for. But I think if we insert some stuff in here, for God so loved the world, or some of these other passages of Scripture, um, like, like the concept that God is not counting your sins against you, to me is intrinsic in the New Testament. But if you don't believe that, and if you don't know you have permission to believe that by virtue of it being revealed in Scripture. So, you know, I know Dan wrote a book on grace and teaches about grace a lot. And one of the big challenges that you face, I know, is helping people understand and believe that they are already forgiven. That forgiveness is not the reward for the repentance. Therefore, repentance takes on a whole new meaning. It takes on a change of mind. It's the same way about the fact that God loves you. God loves you before you were born. He loves you before you did anything. He loves you before you repented. There are people that don't believe that. And there, there are people that don't believe it objectively, but there are also people that just have a hard time believing it. It's really true in their own life and in the lives of the people around them. And so it's somehow, so yeah, Vicki, I'm not trying to suggest that we build our witness off these no, I'm not trying to suggest that we use these scriptures per se, quoting them and finding the right translation that makes them say what we want. I'm, I'm trying to say that we have permission to lay the meta narrative foundation where we can, I can look somebody in the face and I can say, I know that God loves you. I, I personally believe I can look somebody in the face and say, I know that the Spirit has been poured out into your life, and if you'll ask Him, you'll hear yes, that he's in you and he's with you. But I believe the scripture says it. And I don't just do that because I wish that was true. I do that because of what Peter said. And I do that because of these other situations. So this is kind of the exercise, not just to get these verses, but can we add these verses to the underpinnings? Richard? I would just add um, on Ephesians 1, I would add 4 to that too. Okay. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless. Oh, yeah, Ephesians 4.1. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And then um, as far as witnessing, I mean, that's what our testimony is for. You have a experience with God. Those are things you can draw from to tell people about God. And usually it, it strikes something within them that, um, and usually it's a conversation that you're having with somebody and all of a sudden you say, well, you know, I I used to be that way, or I used to, and it doesn't even matter how much of, of your Christian walk you have, even if you're a place where, you know, I used to believe this, but now I'm beginning to see that God is real. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be just as easy as that. Right, and right. then just, well, what do you mean God is real? Well, just because of whatever it is that, yeah. that has been causing that to happen. Yeah. 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 So I was, uh, when I went and sat down, this kind of thought came into my mind. You know I me, mean? I like to just throw this out there. Um, but when Jesus was doing the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, he said, you have heard it said. And he was changing their meta-narrative mm -hmm. about all kinds of things. He was. So maybe that's a place that we can come from and be like Jesus. And when we're talking to people, you know, you've heard it said that God is angry at you. But I'm here to tell you he's not. Right. And here's why. Right. And so, anyway, just be like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, change my nerve. That's great. See, part of this is I want us to have permission. These guys built a list out of Scripture to preach the gospel as they understand it. You have the right to do the exact same thing. I love what Vicky just said because it was kind of it was such a better way to where it was in my head, but in my heart. But I was just thinking that like the first thing I've always been 
I don't want to say I'm anti-Romans Road because I'm not, but I've always been kind of saddened by it. And I think it's because just growing up, I grew up in a very small, very religious town. And I just remember that was kind of the thing, like everybody always talked about. And I remember a girl in our at our junior high and high school that would always go around and tell all of us we were sinners. And she did it out of love for us. But it was like this sadness of, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. And you're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, to where it deflates you. And then when I think what the result of that is that you kind of at the end go look up and you're like, but here's Jesus. And you look up and like, all you can give is like a thanks, like a little bitty distant thank you. But it's like, it paints it paints me as so low mm-hmm. that I can't possibly even address. And so not, so it wasn't even like to me, I don't always think that that addresses even getting someone to be able to really talk well to God, much less say he's in us. And right. so I think that adding the in us piece immediately is such a relieving way for people to say, wait a minute. And so I love the, what Vicki was saying about you've, you've heard it said, because because I think the church has done a really good job at calling people out for sin, if that's what we're supposed to do. Like, like if I go to any of my friends that aren't Christians, that's what they, that's all they see is, is, you all think you think we're all sinners and you're better than us. So that's how they read that versus going, wait a minute. We all do. Yeah. I mean, we all, we've all, we all had sin. We, we were all, we all had this issue we had to deal with. And, but if we paint that first, I think that best, all we can do is give a distant scared. Thank you versus a relationship and a, and a, and that within to go, wow, you're in me, you're, you're a part. And I don't think we hear that ever much less at the beginning, but we don't hear that. And it's not a message out there. Well, and so, so the two verses that, you know, can we add this to the underpinnings, uh, the, the new covenant, that God will have mercy on your iniquities and remember your sins no more. That, that liberates me to not have to try to think that intrinsic in sharing with this person is to get them to admit that they're a sinner or not. People know their sin. They do, you know. And, and so it, it sounds like you're backing off from sin when really what you're doing is you're applying the truth that the structure of what happened on the cross was God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. So maybe we don't have to have a gospel that creates that. The other point that you made that I think is interesting is I don't think there should be such a separation between the story of the gospel and the story of living for God. Because the point of the gospel is so that we can live for God. There's that one passage up there that because uh, he has died for you, so now you can live for him. Last one, Ronnie. So I had a friend, he was a roommate, he was a cadet at the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. And it turns out when you're a freshman there, you're not supposed to look up. You have to look down when you're walking and you have to run from place to place. Okay. Okay. Um, I asked him why. He said, well, because that's the way it is. Everybody does that. And your freshman year, that's what you have to do. So the idea of changing the meta narrative yeah. is to look up. So potentially I could like not do what I had to do. In other words, I had to suffer with sin being important. I had to focus on that a lot, a lot, a lot. It'd be really sad and then change. And the big narrative that needs to change is maybe we don't even need that at all. We just start with God loves us and that's it. Or maybe we can talk about sin in light of God's love. Maybe, but maybe we don't even need to talk about it. And that may be a little scary for people that that's maybe looking up instead of looking down because that's what everybody makes you do because I have to do it, so they're going to have to do it. Right. Just something to think about. Mm-hmm. I hear that. All right. Well, thank you guys. I know that was uh, interesting to the lady. I just wanted you to see basically three points. One, you have permission to talk about what God did out of anywhere you want in Scripture. And so exercise that permission. And then the point is not just to talk about the Scripture, but to apply what it says to life and share your life. Cool. And Joyland has permission to have its own list of scriptures that build its meta-narrative. So we'll probably come up with that.